We're talking about generations now that we are absolutely destroying. This one's paid by this one. This one's paid by this one. My stance on that, of course, it's always ceasefire. The people that are being bombed, they're the casualties of war. They're going to send someone to Washington, D.C. with you to write those policies that they've bought and paid for. The drugs are coming over from American people. They still look to the United States to take leadership. And it doesn't feel like we're leading them. I'm here with Valerie McRae, who is a Democratic candidate for the U.S. Senate seat in Indiana, being made available by incumbent Mike Braun's vacating. So, Valerie, I wanted to start by asking your background, your experience, and what makes you the right candidate to move Indiana forward in 2024? That is a thanks. Thanks for having me. That is an excellent question. And. I'm a, I'm a psychologist. Uh, what we don't have in the Senate is a good psychologist in the Senate. Um, I think that's, it's just a different viewpoint of how we frame every question, how we look at any issue uh, on the table from homelessness to mental health to um, climate change to the, the wealth disparities. Uh, to take it from a mental health lens and say, okay, how is this affecting us in the long run? How are we surviving? How are we dealing with these situations? Because I, I'm one of these strong believers in, in that the health of a nation depends heavily on the mental health of a nation, right? So what I'm bringing to the table is, one, I'm a PhD. Uh, which I don't know if you know this or not, but the, we're scientists first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So everything I look at is from a science, you know, so what are the statistics? What are the, you know, how did they put this methodology together? Um, so I still think in terms of a scientist, but I'm also on the individual level as well, thinking about how it affects people on an individual level. But I've also have always taught social psychology. So that how does this fit in the grander uh, scheme of things, um, how these things are affecting us as a group, as, a, as the United States, as us as a whole, and how does that fit in the global arena as well? I also did see you were the first African-American woman to make it on the ballot in Indiana for U.S. Senate, which congratulations for that. So I did want to ask you about diversity and what you think it means. With only 12 senators of 100 today being from an ethnic background of any kind, with six being Hispanic, three are African-American, two are Asian, and one is an American Indian, and there's also only 25 women. So you would represent a minority in both regards. Can you speak to the importance of diversity and leadership and why you think it's a strength? Let's go with the female thing for first and all. Women are starting to really understand their power in the electoral process. Um, we need that viewpoint. Uh, we, need, um, we need women to stand up for our rights. Um, we need for reproductive rights. We need people of color to stand up for what's happening on the ground level with, with the different diverse groups, Native Americans, uh, African Americans. We've got tons of immigrant issues as well. Um, we need the diversity is going to be just just face it. We are a mutt nation. <laughs> we are just we're we're a mutt nation and we have to bring all those viewpoints together so that we can make decisions that make sense for everybody. Uh, we can't do it with just the white male anymore. It just is not working. We're tired of that. It, is, it has pushed us to, into wars. It's pushed us into these disparity of wealth. We now need a diverse voice. I think that's a, a wonderful way to put it also. I wanted to get into your platform and touch on a couple of the issues that you brought up, brought up to wanting to tackle if you were elected into the Senate. And a lot of the issues that you talk about overlap with the issues that I also talk about on my channel, which is really exciting and refreshing to hear. I wanted to start with housing and zoning into Indiana specifically. The point in time homeless count for 2023 was 4,398 which was up 
710 from the previous year, as well as some reports showing there's only just over 75,000 affordable rental homes with just over 202,000 low-income households. So what do you think is driving the homelessness issue, the housing insecurity issue in Indiana, and what would you specifically do to address it? They want you to have one third. I mean, let's talk about just not even just the homeless, just the regular college graduate, high school graduate, getting out of school. It's so not affordable these days just to, for, for those people that are working, not necessarily the mentally ill as well, but that adds a different layer of things. But right now, it just doesn't make sense. So the problem is, is that wages have not kept up. But yet still housing has went up astronomically. So now we've got people, kids, going back home to live with their parents. Um, the cost of real estate now, what is happening with real estate, for example, you have these hedge funds buying up huge groups of property. So I get, I'm a homeowner, so I get, oh gosh, I can't tell you how many calls I get. Uh, wanting to know if I'm selling my home. It's like my home is my home. It's not your investment. It's not part of your investment portfolio. This is my home. Stop bugging me. If I want to sell my home, I'll let you know that I'm selling my home. But what happens is that when a house goes on sale, these companies come in and they price out everyone else. So young people can't afford to actually buy a house. We're going to have a nation of renters. And that's a mistake. It's a mistake for a lot of different reasons. I tell you one one reason that we found, um, even by getting the signatures, people that are renters move. And when they move, they don't necessarily change their address with voter registration either. So we had, uh, in some places, a third of our signatures thrown out because people really literally didn't change their address with the voter registration. Um, when people are constantly moving, they're also less powerful. Uh, their stress in moving. But for the homeless population, we have to make sure that we have safe places for them to stay. And some of the uh, some of the homeless population, they're afraid to go into a shelter. It's just not safe. Um, they would rather be on the street than to be in a shelter sometimes because it's not safe. There's a lot of rules that they, you know, they can't abide by all the time. They might not get back in time. They might not have this available or that available. Uh, There's so many stipulations, but it's just sad when we're stepping over people, even in Indianapolis downtown, even if you go to the state office building, there's, there's people that are sleeping under blankets in the middle of the winter. Yeah, in the wealthiest country in the world, you would hope that that would be something we could do away with. And I did want to get into wages because wages definitely play into housing. But I wanted to touch on something you said at the beginning of your answer about opening up more places for these houses that they're there. You know, a lot of it comes down to zoning laws where where affordable housing can't be put in these places because of the zoning laws. That kind of leads to like how you said hedge funds coming around and buying up all these properties is trying to work on the zoning laws. So affordable housing is more easy. Easily access is that something you're you would be wanting to work on, or would it be more trying to just bring up wages to meet the prices of homes for you? Both things have to happen. Both things have to happen. One, we do have to make affordable housing accessible in safe places. Um, we have we have people that are in certain areas, but they're dangerous areas. Um, in Indianapolis, there's some they're they're uh, we're we're fighting about bus routes. They're cutting that out so that, that these people can't get to where they need to go to for jobs or or whatever they need to do. Wages have not increased, but yet and still, everything has grown exponentially as far as cost. Education has grown. I mean, eight hundred percent more expensive. Eight hundred percent more expensive to go to school now than it was years ago. So then people have all these crazy student loans to make ends meet, but the salaries have not increased. Not, there used to be, oh, back in the 60s, uh, automatic cost of living increase. That they did away with that. They stopped increasing wages based on the cost of living. It's like it's a, nobody even thinks about it. 
Um, and I suspect maybe this would what keeps our military full. I don't know, but it just doesn't make sense to keep people at these low wages. What winds up happening is that places like Walmart and those sort of things, we subsidize those low wages because we add the health care, we add the um, EBT cards, and we add all these extra things to sort of supplement those low eight wages. So we are actually supplementing these companies. We're actually adding to their bottom line because they don't have to pay these things while their employees are having to take these low wages and then go beg for more money and go ask for money to help the pay their their light, keep their lights on and have to beg for this and beg for that. When if they were paid decent wages in the first place, we wouldn't have these issues. The fact of the matter is right now today, it cost around 35 to $45 an hour to cover real expenses. And, and people are fighting to get 10 or 15 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. When it comes to minimum wage, how is that something that you work with Republicans across the aisle to have some sort of an agreement like, hey, this needs raised? Like, if I'm a Republican congressman, what's the pitch to me to get me to come to the table? But I'd say for the health of the nation um, and the mental health of the nation, people need to have wages that where they're allowed to breathe a little bit. Where at the end of a paycheck and the end of a week, you can not only pay your bills, but you might be able to put $10 away. Right now, what happens is that we blame people for not having 401ks and all these extra whatever when they really don't have enough money to even start thinking about saving, start thinking about vacation, start thinking about college and saving up and all that stuff. They're living week to week. That is not good for our economy. It's not good for our health. It's not good for anything. And it doesn't fuel the economy. We are the spenders. Those people are the spenders, the weekly, the hourly. We, they spend. They keep everything going. Um, it's a win-win. I don't get it while they try to keep people so suppressed. Um, and now they're actually raising the age when you can collect Social Security. So you can't stop working until you're ready to drop. Seems like Republicans want to want to push the edges on both ends of the spectrum. In a lot of red states, you see them wanting uh, child labor protections rolled back so you can work younger. And then they also want Social Security moved up so you have to work older. And, and it's like they just they want you working as long as possible. Exactly. And I don't know if you noticed or uh, knew it or not, but in Paris, um, in France, they tried to up the age where uh, people could go on their social security system. And they went to the streets. The young people went to the streets and say, hey, no, you're not gonna work. You're not gonna force our parents to work until they drop. You promised them 62, you need to stick with 62. Uh, but, but ours are done in such a way where we've inched up to 65 and then now they're 67. Pretty soon, you won't be able to collect anything until you're 70 years old. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky. <laughs> yep. And it's it's a sad reality that we live in. And that's why it's always refreshing to hear more people who are willing to try to preserve these things. I did want to move on to mental health because I saw that was core in your platform. And it's also a core issue in Indiana. As in Indiana, the percent of adults that face anxiety or depression symptoms is actually higher than the national average, as well as age-adjusted suicide rates in Indiana are higher than the national average, suicide by firearm in Indiana, higher than the national average. What do you think is driving this sort of these sort of mental health problems we're seeing in the state? And what would your plan be to kind of address those? Indiana is just now beginning to have a conversation of, of taking away the stigma around mental health issues. Um, we're starting to be able to, to have these conversations and starting to be able to say, hey, I need some help in this area. The problem is, and I will tell you this, and to be truthful, when people ask me, where do I go? I was like, I'm full. I don't, I don't have any more room. And they're like, well, where else can I go? And I have to search. It's not clear. We do have a system called, um, where you can dial 211. And they can try to connect people, and that, that's an improvement to some mental health services. Um, 
But again, a lot of times these are only 72 hour hold situations where they'll go get some help. I uh, usually they're they're get some help. 72 hours later, they're out on the streets. Nothing's changed. Their medications are not stabilized. They're just thrown back out there. Uh, and that's a revolving door, revolving door. No one gets healed in any place long enough to get healed unless you've got some really, really, really great insurance. Um, and, and just face it, people that have mental illnesses are not necessarily the same people or usually not the same people that have jobs and great insurance. Does that make sense? So yes. mm -hmm. um, we were talking about uh, when we talk about some of the single care systems, um, you know, medical care for everyone is also one of my, my platform items. Um, I think there was a plan at one time to sort of rocket back from age 50 or some, from 65 to 55 or something to sort of go from the top and kind of work your way back. But for mental illness, the problems we're going to have are around the age of between age 17 and 25. That's when mental illness occurs, where it shows up, especially for men. So we have to target that group. We're going to have to figure out ways to do group therapies that will affect that as well because we won't, you know, just sort of how do we stretch our dollars? How do we stretch our resources? How do we stretch our people? Um, and then we also have to have a lot of support for the therapists and for the, the, the ground folks because that burnout is really real. Yeah. And it all kind of goes in with each other. That's awesome that you said you do support Medicare for all or single payer. That is something that would uh, erase paperwork and things like that for physicians, which paperwork is, I believe, the leading cause of uh, burnout for physicians. So a lot of that could play into other ways and other ways where more people could be getting help, as well as in Indiana. I think it's 8% of the population here is uninsured, which is way too many people in any state. People being uninsured is just a massive problem in America in general. And in Indiana, only I think I think it's don't not specific. I think between 30 to 35 percent of people that have these sort of mental health uh, symptoms or feel that way have their needs met with therapy, which is actually above the national average, which is also kind of sad. I mean, 30 percent is pretty low to be that to be on the higher end of states. That's something that I think more and more states should be receptive to. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then there are some therapy forms that are coming up, uh, EMDR, ART, that, especially with PTSD and trauma related things, that will help people get better faster. Um, you know, you don't want people in therapy for 20 years. You know, that, that day is, that day is, uh, gone, I guess. But there are some better therapies that we need to make available and, and have people trained um, to make sure that we are able to grab people and, and help them out immediately. Yeah. Definitely. I also saw this kind of to, not to switch gears on you too quick, but I did see this on your website and I wanted to be sure to ask you about it while I had you here, because a lot of people in politics, especially people my age, don't really understand the role that Citizens United played on money and politics and how big of a problem that is. Can you talk about the resolution you mentioned on your website that would amend that decision and why it is you support it and how important it is? And a lot of different issues, whether it's women's reproductive right so whether it's medical care for everyone uh whether it's how much money do we give to this country or that country the majority of americans think alike they want the same things but yet still our leaders are being paid so much especially in the political process so many people most of our, a lot well just put it this way People are bought and paid for before they ever hit office by the donations. Um, if you take money, they're going to send someone to camp. They're going to send someone to Washington, D.C. with you to write those policies that they've bought and paid for. And so when it was such a slippery slope with Citizens United to say that a company is an individual. 
So now we don't have the individual making decisions. We have companies making decisions. The lobbyists making decisions. That's problematic. So we have, when you watch what goes on in Congress, you can almost, you can, you can kind of pimp on, oh, this one's paid by this one. This one's paid by this one. This one's paid by this one. That needs to stop. And there's a whole demographic of people in politics that don't understand that there was a time when corporations didn't have so much power in influencing laws and things like that. I think it was Mitt Romney that said corporations are people, which I have some strong opinions on, but we don't have to open that can of worms here. I did kind of want to zoom out uh, before we ran out of time on the interview. I wanted to zoom out to more broader hotbed issues that are getting discussed that obviously as a senator could come across your desk or your table, your office, whatever the space would be called, be and you might be become a crucial vote on. The first one being the border. I wanted to get your stance on immigration and overall what you think of kind of how it's transpiring between how they can't seem to get along about any of it on the border right now? The border is an issue, but it's not as big of an issue as they're making it out to be. Uh, It's a way of saying, look over here while we do stuff over here. There, you know, the border, the border is an issue. Um, There's always been that flow of people coming back and forth from from South America, from from Mexico, people forget San Diego, San Francisco, uh, Texas. These were Mexican territories. <laughs> there are just as many people going down to Mexico as it is people coming in the United States. I mean, it's it's always been a flow, and so now the fear mongering. There is an issue, but the fear mongering to say they're coming across the border to do all these bad things. Uh, that's not the case. People are trying to live better lives. And we made it almost impossible to get to come over legally. Um, but we do want to know who's here. Uh, we do want to, to make sure we're able to take care of the people that come. Um, I think that when we don't have any type of safeguards, it does open them up. I worry more about them. It opens them up to trafficking. It opens them up to being exploited. It opens them up, you know, in a way to to be misused. So I'm thinking in terms of what it means for them, uh, we're not able to protect them the way they need to be protected if they're coming over here. And we've got to be able to be able to take care of people. We're all one. And sometimes you have to act like it's about drugs. The drugs are coming over from American people. It's not coming under those fences, under the Bob wire. It's coming through big trucks. It's flying over here. It's, you know, it's not getting over here that way. Uh, We do have to do something about the situations in Mexico and some of the areas where you've got the cartels and people are running from violence. Uh, We need to help do something about that, too, as well. I always try to tell people on my channel when it comes to immigration, a lot of people don't think of the economic benefits that we get from immigrants. A lot of our sectors depend on immigrant labor to keep prices so low. And Republicans, uh, it comes down to they don't have a lot of issues to still run on, I feel like. And immigration is one of the few that they can still point to and say, this is what the Republican Party cares about more than Democrats. So a a lot of the time, I think they want to fear monger about it more than they want to solve it, because then it gives them something to run on. The last thing that I did want to touch on, more of a hotbed issue, kind of zooming out as a senator, and I I know it, there's polarizing opinions on both sides of it. As a senator, there might be a resolution that comes that you could vote on. The whole Israel-Palestine situation, are you team ceasefire? Where do you stand on the issue? And, and as a senator, what would your stance be? Let's start with me as a psychologist yeah. that does PTSD evaluations mm-hmm. for wars. Yeah. So Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, I'm there. I'm, I'm interviewing those people that So from a mental health standpoint, the Israeli soldiers, the people that are dealing with the bombing, uh, the the Palestinians, we're talking about generations now that we are absolutely destroying. And I don't care what side you're on. I know that those Israeli soldiers are having nightmares, that they're not going to be able to stand here in the sound of their own children screaming or playing. They're not going to they're going to be having nightmares 
uh, based on the tragedies that they've seen. There's no such thing as bombing and killing people that doesn't affect you as well. We're connected. So I'm thinking about the mental health of not only the Palestinians, but also the mental health of the Israeli soldiers as well. We're creating a disaster. We're creating a system of people that are going to be drastically mentally ill because of all of this craziness that in all of this violence that is totally evil and it's going to affect both sides. It's not like they're going to be able to enjoy that. There are people behind the scenes. This is the people that are fighting those wars, that are bombing, that are the people that are being bombed. They're the casualties of war. The people that are going to benefit. It's a whole different group. Um, I, as a, as a clinical psychologist, someone who does PTSD evaluation, I'm looking at what's going to happen to all of these people that experience that level of trauma. Um, it's a mess. And it's going to be a mess for a while. Um, nobody's going to have a peace of mind for a while. Um, as far as my stance on that, of course, it's always ceasefire. It's always peace. Um, you know, we have to, it's so easy to be, if you're not, what, what I really have problems with, that if you don't say, I'm against this or I'm this, you know, you're labeled as anti-Semitic, you're labeled this, labeled that. I refuse to let anybody label me like that. I'm a humanist. So both sides are important to me. The mental, physical health of both sides are very, very important to me. And there's there's no use in this. The, the thing about it, this, it needs to have a ceasefire. And it's something, and it's not just a temporary ceasefire. It was a certain mindset back in 1940s that said, okay, you want this? We're going to just make these people move. That was setting it up for failure in the first place. Um. I think Absolutely. these humans have evolved past that. The young people have. I have faith in, in the young people. We have evolved past that. But we've got this old relic colonization mentality that's holding us to these old fashioned, we want it, we'll take it, we'll bomb you, we'll kill you. Whether it's Gaza, whether it's Palestine, whether it's um, uh, Taiwan. Africa. Yeah, yeah, there's multiple. Yes, yes. It's we're evolving past that. Yeah, I think at this point it doesn't matter the words you want to use, if it's ethnic displacement, genocide, purging. Yes. Just admit like wrongdoing is happening there. I think that's the first place to come to consensus. International law is being pushed to its boundaries, if not broken. Yeah. And there's a lot of, of change that that could be put in place in in the Middle East. Do you I just one more quick follow up uh, before we end everything. Do you think that the United States should be playing a bigger role in getting them to that? Or do you think that we're kind of let, letting it happen as it will is, is more right where we are? They still look to the United States to take leadership. And it doesn't feel like we're leading on this. But it's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. I think um, there's a lot of people speaking up. What I'm really, really excited about is that there's Jewish people that think like us, that think that want ceasefire. It's not, they're just not just one group. We don't want this. And that's a good thing. And the young people I'm just excited about because I think they're going to carry that on and on and on. Not that I'm not a young person, but you're young. You're young. Yes. Young and young in spirit. Right. Young in soul. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. I think with the billions of dollars, especially that we have invested, uh, the, the billions and billions we've invested in decades in Israel and, and their defense and stuff should give us a bit more of a say. And it seems like we're more following Netanyahu's lead rather than directing him like, hey, you're you're a bit outside of the lines. And I do, before we wrap up, I want to give you the chance if there's any issues that we didn't touch on that you wanted to speak to. If you have any events you want to shout out, you can feel free to shout out your website, any 
of that, you can let the people know the floor is yours. Right. Well, you know what the most exciting thing is that we are on the ballot for the next primary, which is May 7th. We, of course, have a, have a campaign to run and campaigns are expensive. <laughs> so we need people to donate. Uh, and I, not just in donate, but just invest. Be part of what's going on with us. Be part of this movement to get um, more humanistic um, people in, in Washington, D.C. And I, I, I know I'm one of those. It's people that still have the capacity to, to love everybody, still have the capacity to um, think clearly. Um, we need to get behind those people, not just me. But you can start with me by donating to my campaign. But there's more of us like that as well. But my website is just ValerieMcRae.org uh, or ValerieMcRae.com. So I'm going to spell it for you because Valerie is spelled a lot of different ways. But V-A-L-E-R-I-E-M-C-C-R-A-Y.org um, or dot .com. Either one is fine. Um or McCrayUSSenate.com. That works as well. That'll get you to our website. And you can just push that donate button. It takes a lot of money to run. We don't want the big corporate dollars right now or anything like that, unless they're for global warm. I mean, unless they are real advocates for the earth, unless they're real advocates for peace, uh, we don't want your money. Uh, we don't want it. <laughs> we, we don't want it. So what it means is that the people need to help us out, help us get there. Again, it's ValerieMcRae.org, ValerieMcRae.com, and push the donate button. Do what you can. Every little bit counts. If you got the big bucks, though, go ahead and send them because, you know, the more the merrier. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Awesome. And thanks again for taking the time to talk with me today. It was a very interesting conversation. And guys, if you did hear anything you like, if you want to support, donate, keep up with the campaign, remember ValerieMcRae.org, V-A-L-E-R-I-E-M-C-C-R-A-Y.org. Donate, keep up with the campaign. Valerie, again, thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Good job.